Um, I want to welcome you and I want to introduce Madeline Heinlein, who is my dissertation advisor and a graduate of TC. And I thought I'd start out just by asking if any of you had seen the recent article from Thursday in the New York Times where Hillary Clinton was interviewed by Nicholas Kristof. And it was at the Women in the World Conference. And in the interview, Nicholas Kristof asked her to reflect on her understanding of what happened in the election. And I'd like just to read you briefly what she said. I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to stand here. Um, here's what she said. She was puzzled by the fact that she was popular as Secretary of State under President Barack Obama, according to polls at the time that she left the job, but really unpopular as a candidate. Well, what happened? Nicholas Kristof asked. Here's what she said. Oh my gosh, by the time they finished with me, I was typhoid Mary. The difference, she said, was that as secretary, it was a job that I was asked to do by a man. As presidential candidate, she was propelled by her own ambition, a quality, she said, that studies show is seen as unappealing in a woman. Guess whose study she was talking about? Dr. Madeline Hunt. It's true. So. <laughs> That's the influence that research can have on understanding what's going on in the world. And I have the honor of introducing Madeline Heilman to you today. Dr. Heilman is one of the leading authorities in the world on the study of gender bias in the workplace. She is a professor of psychology at NYU and a distinguished visiting professor at UCLA's Anderson School of Business. For the last 40 years, Dr. Madeline Heilman has built a corpus of work that programmatically investigates the barriers faced by women in male-dominated professions. Her seminal work has documented the role of gender stereotypes in the perceived lack of fit of women for leadership positions, what Hillary was referring to, and the resultant negative career consequences for women. Her work documents the costs that women accrue when they are seen as successful that leads to further penalties in terms of their career progress. Dr. Heilman's work was referred to in the New York Times two days ago. It has been referred to there many times on television shows such as Good Morning America. How many of you have heard of Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the research that she relies on is based on the work of Dr. Heilman and it's cited many times over. In recognition of this expertise, Dr. Heilman has co-authored an amicus brief in a United States Supreme Court case on employer liability for sex discrimination. I guarantee a couple people in the room have had to read it in my class. And the plaintiff won. Uh, Dr. Heilman participates in Google yearly PyLab Summit that brings together world-renowned academics from various fields to meet with employees at Google about cutting-edge research issues. And Dr. Heilman's work has an impact internationally. In only the past few years, she has presented her work to academic, business, and government audiences in Chile, Ireland, Switzerland, and Spain. Did I forget any country? Germany. Germany. <laughs> Germany. Speaking of, uh, we'll get to Germany in a minute, too. In recognition of all of this, she has been elected as a fellow of the American Psychological Association, the Association for Psychological Science, the Society for Industrial Organizational Psychology. Dr. Heilman has been awarded the honorary title of ambassador for the Technical University of Munich, which is the MIT of Germany. And today, she will be presented at lunch with the Teachers College Distinguished Alumni Award. Gender equity in the workplace is a critical social justice issue, and Dr. Madeline Heilman was a student at Teachers College of the late Dr. Morton Deutsch, who, as you all know, is an internationally renowned scholar of conflict and social justice. Dr. Heilman built on this foundation of social justice research training that she received at Teachers College and applied it to a population that had received little attention at the time she began her work. Her groundbreaking work provides the foundation on which the whole field of gender bias in the workplace has been built. Not an exaggeration. This foundation was set right here at Teachers College with its deep commitment to research and social justice. Dr. Heilman's scholarship on gender equity in the workplace is groundbreaking, as is her lived experience in her career. She was the very first female faculty member hired at the Yale School of Management in 1972 after she left TC. That's when she knew she had to begin studying this stuff. <laughs> um, Dr. Heilman is also an active mentor and inspired the careers of the next generation of scholars who examine gender barriers in the workplace 
including myself. I was lucky enough to have had Dr. Heilman as my dissertation advisor, Dr. Richard Martell, Dr. Corin moss Rakusin, and Dr. Michelle Haynes, just to name a few. Dr. Madeline Heilman was able to achieve all this while raising a family. In fact, two of her daughters, Allison and Jessica, if you raise your hands, are here today. And we, we definitely needed Allison's help in getting technical support. the technical support because we wouldn't have been here without it. In addition, two of her granddaughters are here today. Hannah and Serena, can you raise your hands? There's Serena and there's Hannah. And her husband, Harvey Hornstein, TC alum, longtime faculty member of the Social Organizational Psychology Program and director of Division II when psychology was in fact a division. Her work in life serves as an inspiration for all women on overcoming barriers that we face in the workforce with perseverance, tenacity, and the love of a really strong family. <laughs> with that, I welcome Dr. Madeline Hines. Since I began working in this area, which has been a long time, an awful lot has changed, and there's no question that an awful lot has changed. I mean, now women serve as presidents of universities, they're heads of major corporations, they're heads of state in many countries, uh, and they've succeeded as scientists and as scholars more than ever before. But it's also clear that we're not quite there yet. Um, you know, in the United States, women still comprise only 20% of the full professors in the natural sciences, only 11% of the engineers, and less than 5% of the CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies. So the increased numbers of women in the workforce really hasn't been accompanied uh, by a full representation of women in many traditionally male kinds of fields and roles and positions. And the question is why? You know, what is what is going on? Uh, and there are a lot of different ideas about this. Um, let me just go through a couple. The first are kind of these pipeline theories. There just aren't enough women available who have the right experience, the right training, the right someone. Then we have the deficit theories. You know, women just don't have what it takes. Um, they don't have the right stuff. They're deficient uh, in the skills, in the motivation, in the whatever. Um, and then we have discrimination. Uh, which is kind of the systematic exclusion of women uh, from certain kinds of positions. And I would argue that it's not that there aren't enough women available, it's not that women don't have the right stuff, but rather that they are victims of discrimination. And the culprit, for me, are gender stereotypes. And what I want to do today uh, is talk about gender stereotypes, what they are, uh, and how they impede women's careers. And I'm going to be arguing uh, that because of gender stereotypes, being confident doesn't assure that a woman will advance to the same organizational level as an equivalently performing man. I'm going to talk about two different types, aspects of gender stereotypes. The first being descriptive, which is conceptions of what women and men are like. And the second being prescriptive, which are the conceptions of how men and women should be. And both of these, as you will see, have real consequences for how women are evaluating uh, in achieving success. Let's start with description. So if you ask people to describe a man and describe a woman, it's remarkable how much consensus there is. And this is whatever part of the country you're in, however people have been educated, however old they are, there are very widely shared ideas about what women and men are like. And they have hung in there. You know, you think with all of the changes that have been, uh, that we've gone through and that we've seen and all of the remarkable progress we've made, uh, that things would have changed, but they really haven't. Uh, the stereotypes seem to, to hang in with very small uh, changes at this point. Uh, I'm talking about stereotypes about women in work settings, not just women as housewives, women in the home. I'm talking about women in, in achievement settings. And lastly, I want to point out that often, they are automatically activated. People aren't even aware of the impact of them. So what are they? Uh, the notion is that men are agentic. They take charge, they get things done, they're achievement oriented. We talk about them in terms of being bold and independent and forceful and so on. On the other hand, women are thought to be communal. 
they take care of others, they're involved in building relationships, they're attuned to other people's needs. We talk about them as being kind and helpful and sympathetic and sensitive and intuitive. And what's very important here is that they're not these conceptions of men and women are only different, but they're what I call opposition, which means that each is thought to be lacking what is prevalent in the other sex. So, whereas we think of men as being decisive, we think of women as indecisive. Men as being strong, women being weak. Men as being bold, women being timid, and so on. So women are not only viewed as communal, but they're also viewed as not being not agentic. And that's a very uh, important point. So what's the problem? I mean, what's wrong with being nice and kind and gentle and caring and concerned about relationships? That's great. And in mm -hmm. fact, you know, my, my colleague Alice Egley has shown that people think women are wonderful. Everybody agrees women are great. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is that Many of the jobs that people seek, the most prestigious, the most sought after, the most lucrative, the most prestigious, are ones that are thought to require agentic behavior, the behavior that men bring to the table, but women don't. And, you know, we're talking about the attributes that are thought that to be required to do these jobs well are not the ones that we think of when we think of women. We're talking about things like taking a leadership role, making tough, hard-nosed decisions, competing, competing for resources, not letting emotions get in the way uh, when we're making decisions, things of that sort. And there's lots of evidence of this inconsistency, but I'll talk about this one because it involves Karen Watt. She's a student. Um, we had 250 managers from across the United States describe men, women, and successful managers. And what we showed was that men and successful managers were described very similarly and women and successful managers were characterized very differently. Let me give you a flavor of this. Um, well, here are the characteristics in which successful managers were rated more similarly to men than to women. <coughs> and as you can see, um, there, uh, there's kind of this um, achievement-oriented aggressiveness, things like assertive and aggressive and adventurous. Uh, there's also a kind of an emotional strength kind of thing going on here, being firm and steady uh, and being able to separate feelings from ideas. And there's also a cognitive style piece of this. Here it's, uh, it's in the analytic, but we often find rational and things of that sort uh, that also go into this. So the consequence is that the stereotype views of what women are like and the male gender typing of jobs leads to what I call a perceived lack of fit. And I have to just warn you up front that Karen has given you my entire, the synopsis of my entire talk, but it's a perceived lack of fit. Um, the lack of fit perceptions that produce this expectation about how an individual is going to perform. I mean, if you think somebody's attributes are a good fit for what's required, for a particular job, and you think they're going to do well at it. But if the fit is a bad one, you don't think they're going to do very well at it. Uh, so women are expected to be very unlikely to succeed at these male gender type of jobs. Those negative expectations are very problematic. Uh, they create a disposition to see women as incompetent and not good at it. And those expectations and incompetence really become the basis of the value. I mean, after all, if I'm predisposed to see, if I see somebody as not being very competent, well, I'm certainly not going to select them for a job uh, that requires those, those characteristics. I'm not going to admit them to school if I don't think they're going to be very competent. If I think somebody's going to be incompetent, I'm not going to place them into a position that's very visible or that's very challenging. I'm not going to assign them tasks that are, uh, you know, that are challenging again or very visible. I'm not going to allocate rewards to them or provide opportunities to them. So the point is that all aspects of evaluative decision making can be affected by this notion that women are incompetent at these kinds of jobs. Very importantly, the worse the fit, the worse this conception of what women are bringing to the table and what is required, the more negative the perception of their confidence is going to be, and the more bias is going to occur. Now, the fit 
because we have these two components, should be worse when the job or position is seen as more male, or when the woman is viewed in more stereotypical terms. And there's evidence that both aspects of this kind of model, this lack of fit, uh, can uh, affect the degree of gender bias that we Let's start with the maleness of the position. Um, research has shown that bias against women is greater when a position is considered to be male and gender type. What does that mean? It, it can mean a lot of different things. We can be talking about the occupational domain, so it may be industry or the military versus something like education or social service. Uh, it can be the specialty within an occupation. In medicine, it might be with surgery versus pediatrics. In law, co corporate law versus family law. In the academic world, sciences versus the humanities. In business schools, finance versus organizational behavior. And we could go on. Uh, it also can reside in the type of organizational position that people have. Uh, and here I mean a line position versus a staff position. Um, and let me illustrate this quickly with some data, some field data. Uh, Caroline Ness, who's a colleague at, at Root, and I got a hold of, uh, some time ago, got a hold of these performance evaluations of these very upper level managers at a major financial services organization. And we just simply divided them into staff positions, which are things like human resources and external affairs and line positions, which are things like business management and operations management and sales and things of that sort. Uh, we did all the right things that you should control for. And what we really <laughs> want, I'll, I'll skip all that stuff. What we really wanted to see is if women were evaluated differently than men, um, depending upon the nature of their jobs. And what we found, and I have to tell you, this was a 27 point performance evaluation scale, which was a little crazy, but that's why we have these numbers. And what we found is that we only found women to be rated uh, less well than men in the line positions, in the positions that we would consider to be male gender type. In the staff positions, which are considered to be more female gender type, we did not find that this difference here is not statistical. So, okay. um, these are correlational data. It's conceivable, I guess, that all the women here really were less competent. Uh, but there's lots of experimental evidence that would demonstrate that the kind of bias that's evident here happens when the job is considered to be male. Let's talk about that second component of this lack of fit model, the stereotyping of women. There should be, according to this model, more gender bias when stereotypes are activated, when you're thinking about gender. And we've done a ton of stuff with this. Let me see if I can run through some of it. Scarcity. Um, work with Steve later showing that the, when you vary the percent of women in an applicant pool, the same woman with the same profile is rated more negatively when there's a lower representation of women than when there isn't. Again, we would argue here that gender becomes very salient when the woman is alone, and that activates stereotypes. Focus on diversity. Um, research I did with Brian Welly. Uh, we, we presented people with a group. I believe it had one woman and three men. And we told them that the group was assembled either to, um, for, for reasons of diversity, to maximize diversity, to be representative of the organization, or we assembled the group on the basis of expertise and what people could bring in terms of, of expert resources. Or we just said that the group was assembled based on who was kind of around, who was available to participate at the time. And we asked people to evaluate um, members of this group in terms of competence. And we found consistently that the woman was evaluated more negatively in terms of competence when we said the group was assembled based on diversity. Okay. <clears throat> diversity became uh, a way of making gender salient and activating stereotypes. Attractiveness. Um, throughout my career, every, I don't know, 15 years, somebody comes along and wants to do something on attractiveness, some student. Um, and it's always fun to do. Uh, and what we have found, we call these my, my beauty can be beastly 
set of studies. Um, because what we find is that when women are attractive and stereotypes are activated for upper level jobs or other kinds of male gender type jobs, uh, it is a distinct liability. Great for any other kind of job, but when it's a distinctly male gender type job, being attractive doesn't work very well. <coughs> Motherhood. I mean, what could be more activating of gender stereotypes than motherhood? Talk about this for a minute. We did a great study, Tyler Okimoto and I did this. Uh, participants reviewed information about four different candidates for promotion to assistant vice president uh, position. They all had MBAs, they were all in their mid 30s, they'd all been doing very, very well. Uh, and we then said the applicants were either a male parent female parent, a male non-parent, a female non-parent. And we just vary the parental status very simply by having them circle a children or no children response. And then we said, you know, we want you to make a screening recommendation. You have to make a choice of which one of these candidates to eliminate, kind of a survivor <coughs> paradigm. Who, who should not go on? We have to kind of prune our applicant pool. And let me show you what happened. <laughs> Isn't that dismal? That's like really depressing. Okay, um, and we interpreted this as, you know, mothers are being eliminated most frequently when gender stereotypes are most activated, bias is most activated. People often ask me what happened in this non-mother condition here. And all I can say to you is, I really don't know what would have happened if we'd asked them to eliminate two people. But I can guess. <laughs> okay, so just to summarize here, research shows that variations in either component of this lack of fit model lead to differences in the degree of bias. Um, and stereotypes about women. This is a very important point. They don't always lead to gender bias. It's only when there are these negative performance expectations because of this lack of fit, this perception that there's a lack of fit. <coughs> so why do they persist? Why do these expectations they persist? I mean, people work alongside women. People know that women are competent. What's going on? Um, what's going on is that we're very lazy talking about uh, and, you know, expectations make life easy, they make life orderly, you don't have to think too hard, you don't have to you know, work too hard at it. And so you, you kind of see what you want to see, and they tend to perpetuate themselves. Um, let me give you an example of this with some work that we are currently working very hard on, Francesca Manzi over there and I, and another colleague. Um, The question we are asking is, what happens to stereotype-based gender expectations? How, how do they affect how you update and revise confidence impressions? What happens when people's performance gets better? And what happens when, pe when people's performance gets worse? Um, and we did a series of studies about this. Um, we provided information about a male or a female student's performance in two independent units of a course. It was a computer science course, so it was a very male gender type. And everybody performed great at the beginning, and then for the second half, people either continued to perform well or their performance declined. And then we asked people to rate the competence of the person overall for the course. What happened? Well, first of all, you can see that when, when performance didn't change, they saw the person who was doing well. Men and women were no different. But when performance declined, everybody was rated lower. But you'll notice that women are rated even lower than men are rated. So that the de information about decline was more of a detriment for women than it was for women. Everybody was seen as Same thing happened when we looked at improving performance. Here we started people off, they were all doing poorly, some did better, some stayed the same, and here's what happened. And everybody continued to do poorly, men and women were seen the same, but when they improved, everybody got better, but women didn't get 
quite as much better as an issue. Improving performance was much more of a benefit for men than it was for women. So because of expectations, and again, we're saying here that expectations are hanging in there. They're kind of pulling, they're tugging. You're making them come true. And so even when you have this disconfirming evidence, you're, you're being constrained by what those expectations were to be. So people are amenable to giving up perceptions of women's competence. They are much more reluctant to relinquish perceptions of their incompetence. And we took that as, take that to this day, as evidence that expectations kind of hang in. And they have negative consequences. Well, expectations have these very insidious consequences. They affect what people tend to. Um, people <coughs> seem to attend to consistent information and ignore or exclude potentially disconfirming information. So if I have a negative expectation about somebody, I might not notice a brilliant uh, comment they make or a key work experience on their resume or a glowing comment that's made by a recommender. I just don't, it doesn't register. Expectations also affect how behavior is interpreted. I mean, if somebody is consulting with other people, if it's a man, well, he must be people on the board. Uh, if it's a woman, she must be insecure. Uh, if somebody is deliberating before making a decision, if it's a man, he's being prudent. If it's a woman, she's being timid. If somebody's changing course of action, if it's a man, he's flexible. If it's a woman, she's flighty, she's indecisive, and so on. So we maintain these expectations by the way we interpret them. They also affect what people remember. Uh, and forget. Um, because of negative expectations, I might not only forget the time that a woman was brilliant, uh, but I might remember that one time <coughs> that she really blew it. Um, and I may remember things that didn't even really happen. I mean, I may think that it was, you know, this Susan, not Joe, who made that lousy suggestion the other day. And on the other hand, I may think it was Joe and not Susan who made that fabulous suggestion that changed everything. And there's evidence that this kind of stuff happens. Um, expectations also affect how people assign credit. So if a woman is successful, then it must be, I mean, it must be because she was lucky. Or maybe somebody helped her. Um, I mean, she's not competent, right? So there must be another explanation. It's very difficult to break the hold of these expectations. Very difficult. And if they're to be challenged, then a woman's competence has to be very loud and clear and unambiguous. There really has to be airtight because if there's any room, um, those expectations swoop in and they fill in the vacuum. Now, unfortunately, ambiguity typically abounds in, in work settings. I mean, there's often very little objective information available. Performance of the kind that we know of often is not quantifiable. I mean, it's not like taking a test or a number of sales. I mean, that's great. But writing a report, um, you know, how, how do you it's not an object thing that you can objectively measure. Um, the criteria for judging performance uh, are vague and simple. I have charismatic here, but think of these things. We talk about resilience, <coughs> being a team player in research, rigorous, um, cutting edge. I like that. These are very squishy. They really <coughs> allow for a lot of subjective interpretation. And then the, the structure for evaluation is typically poorly defined, so that different criteria are used differently when you're evaluating different people. And lastly, because we work so much in teams and collaboratively, there's often a lot of confusion about individual <coughs> contribution to a work product. And that's just, it's not a bad thing that we work in groups, it's a good thing, but it is a consequence of that. Let me give you an example of how that can be an issue. Research that I did with Michelle Haynes years ago 
uh, we had research participants receive information about a male and a female employee who were working together on a task, it was a very male type task, and kind of creating an investment portfolio, some kind of yield, uh, and they were informed, the participants, that this work product was very successful. They worked great together, they came out with this great outcome. And then we said, what do you think, you know, what do you think was going on while they were working? Um, you know, what do you think was happening in terms of people's competence, who had more influence, their, who was the leader, and so on. <clears throat> and what we found was pretty short. In all cases, people thought that the man was more competent, exerted more influence, and took the leadership role more than the woman. I really want you to think about this. It's absolutely, you, you hear that there are two people working on a task. And they're very, very successful. What? Why wouldn't you say it was 50-50? There's absolutely no reason not to do that. Um, and we couldn't make, you know, one of the things you do as a social psychologist to understand effect is you try and make it go away. Finally, the way we got it to go away was to kind of structure the task so we essentially said the woman had 50% of the information, the man had 50% of the information. And under those conditions, people would, okay, yeah, they both participated. Uh, without that, people persisted. Um, we also found that those ratings, that pattern of behavior only happened when it was a male gender type task. People were talking about other things, not working on a financial task, working on a more social task, or a, a problem-solving task of a different sort. Uh, this didn't happen. It also didn't happen if women were working with other women. We also found parallel findings with failure, and in this case, women are blamed more for failure than their So, I do very depressing research. <laughs> <laughs> really very depressing research. It gets worse. Um, okay, so let me just sum this up. Descriptive gender stereotypes result in these negative performance expectations. The expectations lead to perceptions of incompetence uh, and then to bias. And the worse the fit, the more the job is seen as male, the more you see the women in stereotype terms, the worse the expectations. And those expectations really hang in there. They're tenacious and they're self maintaining. And ambiguity allows them to flourish. But sometimes, sometimes women are acknowledged to be successful. Either there's objective data about their performance, um, or they are validated by some very respected source who kind of sponsors them. Or they have so many repeated successes, there's so much consistency that you simply can't deny that what is happening is happening. So what happens then? Is the problem gone? Because now, after all, women are seen as competent. <clears throat> now you have a different problem. And the problem is that you now have a bad fit between what a woman is thought to be like and what she should be like. And if you remember before, I talked about gender stereotype not only being descriptive, but also being prescriptive. Let's talk about that. So prescriptive gender stereotypes designate how women and men should be. These are the norms about appropriate behavior. And the attributes that are so we positively value so much in women are those that are the ones that become normative. So communality, which we value so much, is part of women's shoulds. But there also are normative should nots. And agentic behavior, which we value so much in men, is, is really off limits for women. It's really prohibited. And we know from the li literature that that there are pro that normative violations typically result in penalties. There's a lot of disapproval, and there are penalties. And this is in general, norms are when they're when they're violated, it's problematic. And so the question for us is, what happens when women are successful? Are they penalized for being successful? And there was some suggested evidence uh, that led us to kind of speculate that the answer was not going to be a happy. 
The first is, Karen alluded to the Ann Hopkins case. I don't know if people know about the Ann Hopkins case. That was the first case uh, where psychological uh, evidence was about gender stereotyping was used in the Supreme Court. Um, and let me tell you just quickly about this. Ann Hopkins was a top-notch performer at Rice Waterhouse, which was then one of the nation's big eight uh, accounting firms. This was in the 80s, the late 80s. Uh, and she was only one of 88 candidates for partner in a given year that was a woman. And there were only seven out of the 662 partners in that firm who were women. Now, Ann Hopkins had more billable hours. And here we have a concrete measure. Okay, this is uh, an objective measure. She had more billable hours than anybody else who was going up for partner that year. She brought in a ton of business. There wasn't any question. This was a competent person. I think everybody would agree with that. But instead of being promoted, uh, she was put on hold. Uh, she wasn't put up the following year, and she sued. And at some point during this, the American Psychological Association asked uh, four of us to work on an amicus brief for the justices to educate them about gender stereotyping. This was Susan Fisk, uh, Kate Doe, Jean Bordita, and myself. And as we kind of poked around in all the depositions and all the stuff that you get, that lawyers get to do with this stuff, we found that Ann Hopkins had been called macho. She'd been told that she needed a course at charm school. She was advised to walk more femininely, to talk more femininely, to wear more makeup. And she was accused of using vulgar language, and being abrasive. That's just my summary here. Uh, she was the object of disapproval on social centers, and frankly would have never, ever been directed at a man. And she personally did win this suit. Well, the Hopkins case certainly suggested that there are penalties for violating the shoulds of gender stereotypes. And it also suggested that the penalties are social in nature, I mean, Anne Hopkins was really not white. And that's also consistent with some uh, data that we had kind of incidentally come upon. Uh, when we had asked people to describe successful women managers, Karen was part of this, a set of attributes emerged that differentiated these women from other women and also from successful male managers. And let me just show you what Bitter, quarrelsome, selfish, deceitful, devious, manipulative, and I can add to that, untrustworthy, conniving, cold, I think you know the drill, okay? Our bitchy cluster, yes. but we don't call it that. When we write, we call it interpersonal stuff. <laughs> and it seems that when a woman is successful, it can bring on these very negative reactions. And since advancement is likely to depend not only on competence assessments, but on you know, social acceptance. This can obviously be a real issue. So we decided to look at the systematic. Uh, asking that question, are women who are successful and traditionally male are women penalized for their success? <clears throat> Let me tell you quickly about this. We examined reactions to women and men who worked on the same male gender type task when there was or was not information that they'd been successful. We expected that women would be rated as less competent when information about their performance was ambiguous for all the reasons I've talked about so far, the presumption that they're incompetent. But that women would be rated as less likable and more interpersonally hostile. We had students, uh, participants, they were told they'd be reviewing different employees holding the same position. They were given information about this job, which was a male gender type job. Uh, and we gave them background information about a male and a female <laughs> assistant vice president. We had two very similar versions. And then we asked them to rate the person's competence, their likability, and their interpersonal hostility. And here that was measured with abrasive, manipulative, selfish, pushy, and contrary. How did we vary the clarity of performance outcome? We did it very simply. Whether the person had already undergone the company-wide performance review. 
So in the ambiguous success information condition, Andrea or James was just about to undergo a performance review, whereas in the clear success information situation, Andrea or James had already undergone that performance <coughs> review and had been designated as a top, top, top. So here's confidence rating. So in the ambiguous situation, person had not yet undergone this performance review, woman is assumed to be less confident. All the reasons we've talked about. So when they're clearly successful, very clear success, it eradicates that when they've never seen as equal. So we have equal confidence. Let me show you what happens with life. Ambiguous success, person hasn't yet undergone this review, men and women pretty well liked, eight on a nine point scale, equal. Clear success. Look at what happens. Okay. We've got these women being rated uh, as much less likable than the men in the clearly successful situation. And this happens the same way in the interpersonal disability situation. So in the ambiguous situation, men and women are seen as pretty equivalent. When there is clear success, look at that rate for women. They just skyrocket. Don't forget, we're talking about cold and conniving and miserable, miserable. When success wasn't clear, women were seen as more incompetent. When their success was clear and they were acknowledged to be competent, they're seen as more unlikable and they are more personally derogated. And you know, they're really seen as awful here. We're talking about selfish, pushy, manipulative, and so on. And so we took that as supporting the idea that gender bias can result from prescriptive as well as descriptive. Stereotypes. Okay. Only when the job is male gender type does this happen. Uh, so success is not always a horrible thing for women. I just don't want to leave you with that idea. It's only when women are successful in areas where they are not supposed to tread. It's where they don't belong. You can be successful. So it's not that the, the gender stereotypes are unequivocally negative. It's they're negative when you're kind of violating some description. And it's, it's a very important point. I don't want to leave you with the feeling that it's, it's, it's forever. Success is OK, unless it's off limits. Um, <laughs> we've demonstrated that this life can have career consequences, uh, and that um, we can sometimes soften this reaction if we provide some information about a woman's femininity. And I just have to say this, that you've got to be careful with that. Because if you provide information about femininity and it's not absolutely clear that the woman is competent, then we're back to the first part of the talk. It's just more stereotype. So I always think about, I think about Hillary, uh, not this time around, but the last time around was once, I don't know if you've seen those clips, but she was sitting in this diner in New Hampshire and she was exhausted and somebody asked her a question and she teared up. And for like three days, nobody said anything bad about her. Mm. She, they said she humanized herself. Well, what she really did is she, she, it's like a spoonful of sugar, you know, helps the medicine go. But it's, don't run out and buy really pink dresses or start crying in, in your supervisor's <laughs> office. Because unless you're really super clear that you're competent, it's going to wind up just activating those stereotypes more and making you look more incompetent. Okay, so when women are successful and they're finally accepted as competent, they're not liked, they're viewed in these very negative terms, uh, being successful doesn't really end the problem. And I can kind of stop here. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I'll just put these up, okay, because I think they're interesting. Uh, other questions that have come up. You know, do, if women know that they're going to be penalized for being competent, what do they do? Um, do they limit themselves? Do they inhibit themselves? Do they not show that they're confident? I think that's a very important issue. Um, I've talked about being penalized for doing what you're not supposed to do, for being dejected. Um, but I think women also are penalized when they don't do what people think they should do. And I have research showing, for instance, when people ask for help in a work setting. Uh, if men don't help, nobody pays any attention. If they do help, they fabulous. Uh, if women help, nobody pays attention. But if they don't help, all hell breaks loose. I mean, they just think they're horrible people. 
I think there are lots of instances like that where there are shoulds. And it may not just be having coffee for everybody or making arrangements for the room. It's also stuff like, we're supposed to be cheerful and collaborative. What if you don't want to be collaborative? Collaborative and so on and so forth. There are lots of shoulds. Um, in all of the studies that I've done, I never find any difference between women and men. You would think women would not engage in this kind of behavior. Um, and only men would. It doesn't happen. So it's a very important question. Why are women doing this to each other as well as men? Um, Francesca's work does having a woman at the top help. We have this notion that if you just get a woman in a senior role, everything will be okay for other women. And it turns out that it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, that in fact, having a woman in a senior role even if she's successful, it doesn't seem to help all that much for other women coming up. But boy, if she's not successful, uh, it's a real problem. So this notion that we just get people into these roles and everything will be better. And the last is how do gender stereotypes affect men? They should, they do. We've shown that men are penalized <laughs> when they're successful in female types of jobs. Um, they're not penalized by being seen as unlikable. Uh, but they're penalized by being seen as weak, and so they're disrespected rather than disliked. Okay, I will end. Uh, both prescriptive and descriptive aspects of gender stereotypes can produce bias. Women in traditionally male career paths are in a double bind. Uh, when they're not clearly successful, they're not seen as competent. When they are clearly successful, they're not liked. And each of those has to be a little Okay, I just want to thank all of you. Summarize, you explain why Trump won. People like Chris. People like what? Chris. Chris. Trump won because people Chris. like Chris. Well, people yeah. like oh. Chris. Yeah. Are you asking me that question? You explained it. Oh, I explained oh, it. Oh, explain huh. why. Yeah, why he won. Well, that I think is a different issue, like what people want from their leaders. And does he fulfill this kind of notion of like a strong, tough uh, guy who he may fulfill that for some of us, but not for others. And I guess that may explain some of the vote. Oh wait, you had somebody over there. I only have one more. I'm going to take the corner because you have hands up. Go ahead. So, do you feel that the structured interview uh, neutralizes the women moving up? I think that anything that you can do in the decision-making phase of uh, evaluations that will structure it more so that the same criteria being used in the same way with the same weighting mm -hmm. is going to help um, because it doesn't allow these expectations to dictate what you're looking at and how you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. So I think it should help. Take one more. One more. Yeah. Is, uh, do you think there's the overarching question of whether or not we've set the wrong expectations for business in general, that we've um, attributed some of these negative, uh, these what are considered to be female characteristics that are really important for men to oh, yeah. exhibit as well. But they, we, we, they, that's yeah. really a big, bigger problem, but we've set the wrong expectations for managing a business? I, I don't know if it's the bigger problem, but it is a problem, because the jobs that we consider to be male gender type and only requiring these agentic characteristics, you're absolutely right. What does a manager do? They deal with people. If you think about that, they manage conflict. Those are the things that women are supposed to be good at, right? And we don't think of those. We think of the hard-nosed kinds of pieces of it. So people are starting to think about, if you define a position, and they've shown it empirically, um, as, being, as having more of the qualities that really are required, you get much less bias against women. Once you define them that way, in an advertisement, you'll get more women to apply for those jobs. And in evaluations, you'll get people to probably get a happier workforce at yeah. the same time. I mean, you know, there are stereotypes about people, there are also stereotypes about jobs, which is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. But a really good point. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much.